All right, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this morning for our second uh, event in our Car Coffee with an Archaeologist series. So we, we launched this program last month. Our first in our series was a special event just for K-12 teachers to familiarize them with our virtual field trip offerings this fall. The museum is remaining closed to the public this semester, but we're still gonna keep going with our virtual programming. So we're really great. Uh, uh, happy to have you all here today. My name is Candace Cravens and I'm the assistant director with the museum. And our guest today is Dr. Phil Carr, who is professor of anthropology here at South Alabama. And he is going to be chatting with us today about the basic basics of archeology. span So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Candace. And it's uh, great to have you all here in our virtual environment. Um, not one that I'm particularly accustomed to as an archaeologist, much more accustomed to stone tool technology than I am to Zoom rooms, but we're going to see if we can make this work. And I'm going to share my screen and just work our way through some slides um, to get us to think about what is archaeology, uh, particularly what good is archaeology, and hopefully we'll end up with looking to the future because for me archaeology is investigating the past for the future. So there we go. So in in chat I was hoping you guys might just give me some thoughts. When you hear archaeology what do you think of? So what comes to mind when you hear the term archaeology? Now I may need and just to help me figure out exactly how I can find chat. Oh, there we go. Excavations, thank you. Yes, archeologists excavate. Fossils, that is commonly comes to mind indeed. Digging up artifacts, that's right. Um, we, we, we are, uh, you know, we do dig but I do prefer the term excavate, you know, when we're putting a fine uh, uh, soil profile together, uh, digging in a one meter by one meter unit, we're doing that excavation, but it is all, it's all digging. We're, we're diggers, that's what, that's what we do as archeologists. So, oh, there we go. This is sort of a collage of what I think of when we, um, you know, uh, people hear archeology span or what I commonly, uh, people uh, mention. So it's, it's about the technique of the digging, the excavating. It's about the, the things that we find, whether it's skeletal remains, uh, below ground things like pottery and stone tools, or above ground things like, like pyramids. So these are all things that come to mind when you hear archaeology. Um, archaeology also has this um, relationship with Hollywood and unfortunately for archaeology, Hollywood has provided many ideas of what we do that are a little off base. So tomb raiding is not what I would like you to associate with archaeology. So what I'd like to start with then are three things that archaeologists don't do. Then we'll talk about three things that archaeologists do and then I hope we'll bring it around to what is the value of archaeology. So three things archaeologists don't do. So these um, skeletal remains of dinosaurs, these fossil remains, um, while archaeologists are interested in fossil humans, we don't do dinosaurs. So the first don't, archaeologists don't dig up dinosaurs. Um, it's actually the paleontologists who do dinosaurs. So if you remember back to Jurassic Park, uh, there's a neat excavation scene and our uh, hero here in the bottom right um, is a paleontologist, not an archeologist. So archeology span then has interested in humans and digging up artifacts and using those artifacts to tell us something about the human past. Um, really the earliest artifacts are about 3 million years old. So uh, dinosaurs going extinct at 65 million years old they're too old for archaeology. So the geologists, uh, particularly the specialty of paleontology, they're the ones that do um, the dinosaurs. So if you thought archaeologists uh, 
dug up dinosaurs, you're with probably the majority of people, but it's actually not us. Another image that commonly comes to mind when you think of archaeology or when people think of archaeology is Egypt or Greece. And certainly there's wonderful archaeology that can be done in Egypt or Greece. And when I tell people I'm an archaeologist um, and they ask me, you know, when's the last time I did my excavating in Egypt or Greece, you know, I have to kind of be a little chagrined and say, well, I've never even been to Egypt or Greece. And that's when they give you that look like, Mm, you can't really be an archaeologist if you've not been to Egypt or Greece. But I'm here to tell you, archaeologists don't just work in Egypt. Um, we can do archaeology right here in Alabama. Archaeology, interested in the human past, um, anywhere there's been humans in the past, we can do archaeology. And we can do archaeology of the more ancient past, um, the first indigenous peoples in this country, uh, left a long archaeological record. And then the University of South Alabama has also been uh, uh, working at the site of Old Mobile, Dr. Greg Wazelkoff, doing historic archaeology, archaeology of the more recent past. So we don't just work in Egypt, we can work anywhere where there's been people in the past. And there are archaeologists who uh, specialize in Egypt, we call them Egyptologists, uh, they tend to be in departments of classical archaeology. So here's our another movie hero archaeologist, uh, Indiana Jones, and Indy isn't going after the common artifacts. Indy's going after treasure, but I'm here to tell you archaeologists don't dig for treasure. Um, or another way to put it is archaeologists consider what they dig up to be treasure, but nobody else would. Uh, we find broken bits of things, things that people have uh, considered trash and they've thrown out. So it's not particularly glamorous. Um, you wouldn't sell what we find as archaeologists on eBay for the most part. So it's tiny bits of things that we uh, sort through in our screens, uh, brick, nails, um, so we can figure out evidence for structures. Sometimes we find animal bones um, and we can learn something about diet. So archaeologists are interested in the stuff that people threw away that can tell them about everyday life in the past. So three things archaeologists don't do. We don't dig for dinosaurs, we don't just do archaeology in Egypt, and we don't dig for treasure. So archaeology is the study of people in the past through artifacts. So archaeology as a subdiscipline of anthropology, and anthropology is the study of people, archaeology puts people first too. So archaeology, yes we dig up artifacts, but what we really, uh, the purpose of digging up those artifacts is what they can tell us about people in the past. So people are the focus of archeology. span So artifacts are clues. So um, somebody of, of maybe my age that's in the audience here can think of, you know, Scooby-Doo has sort of weathered the test of time. Um, artifacts are clues for archeologists and it's a, an appropriate um, I, I think comparison to say that archaeologists are sort of detectives. We use the artifacts to tell us about what life might have been like for people in the past. All right, so now we want to talk about three things that archaeologists do. And we're going to use the same set of artifacts to sort of use this as an example. So these are Clovis projectile points. It's a particular style of projectile point that's very finely made. Some of the earliest occupants of North America, the Western Hemisphere, were um, used these. Uh, these were hunters and gatherers hunting large game. Um, and so it's a very specialized technology. And we want to see what can we learn, the three different things we might be able to learn from these types of artifacts. So archaeologists do date artifacts. We are very interested in time. So what we see here in this slide is at the, at the bottom of our soil profile, the, that wall profile you see is sort of a brownish soil. Above that is a dark soil with some um, shell remains, some white shell in it. And then above that is a dark layer with very little shell in it. So we want to uh, excavate very carefully because depending on what layer we find the artifacts in, that can tell us something about time. 
So that brown level at the bottom is relatively older than the black level with all the white in it, and that's relatively older than the dark level above it. So we can't say exactly how much older they are, Soil doesn't build up exactly the same way everywhere through time, but we can say that the things at the bottom are relatively older if they are undisturbed. So if the soils haven't been disturbed by nature or human action, then the layers at the bottom are the oldest, and that helps us date the artifacts. So we do know these Clovis artifacts date to, to quite a long time ago because we consistently find them in the archaeological record below others. So archaeologists excavate carefully, and this is a dry rock shelter in Nevada, and you can see some different uh, soil layers here. So we have a student who's carefully excavating a 50 by 50 centimeter square. He's using a trowel and putting all the soil into a, um, a bucket there, and, and uh, that'll get screened. So he's looking for artifacts as he does this excavation, so he can measure them exactly in place. And the other archaeologist on the left that's kneeling down there is getting ready to take a picture of a fire hearth that showed up in that fire uh, in that profile. So it, it's uh, there's a dark layer of charcoal and then a gray layer of ash, and, and so there's a feature right below that folding rule that's extended there. So archaeologists are very interested in the exact location of the artifacts that we find, which soil layer they come from. And I, I love this photo from that same rock shelter. So we're, we're working here. It's a dry rock shelter and there's actually some basketry remains um, right in front of the student on the right there. But both uh, of these archeologists are holding pencils because they're gonna record things. One, one of the points I wanted to make is that when archeologists excavate a site, they destroy it. So we have to take lots and lots of notes. Um, so we, the pencil is the most important tool that an archeologist has because we have to record what we're finding, where we find it, in order to make sense of the things that we find. So uh, I wanted to make that point. So all of this is, is helping us to date the artifacts as well as associate the artifacts with, with other things. So we're building up our clues here. So I want to talk real briefly about dating artifacts with, with what geologists call the law of superposition and archeologists employ the law of superposition. And that law of superposition is the layers at the bottom are the oldest, if undisturbed. So I want to use my laundry basket here to, to help explain that. So this is a full laundry basket, but we generally do our laundry on Sunday. So Sunday evening when you go to take your shower and throw your clothes in the laundry basket, it's, it's empty. So Sunday's clothes go on the bottom of the basket. Then Monday's clothes go on top of that, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and then Fridays. So you could excavate that laundry basket and you would go back in time through each layer. So, so Friday's clothes would be on top, then Thursdays, then Wednesdays, then Tuesdays, then Mondays, and then Sundays. And on Friday, if I remembered I left a $20 bill in my pants on, on Sunday and I need that $20 bill, I'll tear through the laundry basket, find my pants, take out that $20 bill, and then stuff everything back in. Well, I've just messed up the law of superposition. I've disturbed the layers. So now I can't use those layers anymore to tell time because of that uh, site formation process is what archeologists would call it. We, we've, we've disturbed it. And as I said before, mother nature can disturb archeological sites, humans can disturb archeological sites. So one of the reasons we excavate very carefully is to look for any disturbances in the soil that might tell us that the artifacts are out of place. Because if they're out of place, and then the law of superposition doesn't apply and we can't use that to help date the artifacts. So the first thing we do is we date the artifacts. We can use these same artifacts, these Clovis points, after we've got a good date for them, we place them in time. Now we want to say, well, what do they tell us about the people? So we're gonna ask different questions of the same artifacts and we're gonna use different techniques to do that. So we are, uh, we're interested in well, how do people live? What was their life like? And we have here then um, sort of a scene, probably uh, the artist was trying to base it on an archeological site in the Tennessee River Valley um, about 9,000 years ago. The people at that time lived by hunting and gathering in small groups, 20 to 25 people. 
relatively ephemeral houses. They're not particularly um, uh, made to, to stand up the test of time. They may only be at this location for a couple of months before they move on to an area to exploit other kinds of resources, um, plants, uh, animals, fishing, and, and so forth. So archaeologists want to take the artifacts and say, how do, how do they tell us um, about life in the past? What information do we get? And that would be a whole class to, to spend a lot of time on this particular question. Um, so I'm going to kind of skate over that um, in general. So archaeologists do detailed studies. So we try to piece the artifacts back together. We look for traces and residues, microscopic analysis, chemical analyses. So we try to get as much information as we can about those artifacts to see what they can tell us about the manufacturing techniques, the use, and then why was not something discarded? All of those are questions archaeologists are interested in to tell us about what, um, what life was like for people in the past. Archaeologists even do experiments. So in the upper left there, we see Jacques Pellegrin, a Paleolithic archaeologist from France, and he's showing some techniques that Neanderthals would have used to make their stone tools. Um, in the middle, we have um, some archaeologists trying out atlatl spears. They're doing some spear throwing to see how well uh, different sized projectile points work there. So um, commonly people, when they see a stone tool, they, they call it an arrowhead. Uh, more likely, it's an atlatl spear point or a knife. Um, and size can tell us that. So we do experiments with aerodynamics and, and we look at the edges, the kind of use wear that's on these stone tools to tell us how they were used. And it turns out that the larger ones tend to be used as spear points, ones that are sort of a moderate size were knives, and the smallest ones were arrow points. And then in the bottom right, we see someone using a stone tool to scrape a hide. Um, so that leaves different kinds of traces on the edges of the stone tool than you would see from manufacture or use as a projectile. So these experiments are extremely important for archaeologists to get a sense of um, how these artifacts were used and that helps us to paint a picture of what life was like in the past. And we can use these same artifacts again. So these Clovis projectile points, we place them in time. We've used them to give us a sense of what life was like. So these would have been spear points, um, very well made, reliable tools. Um, if you're going to be hunting mammoth, you don't want your spear point to break in an inopportune time. So you want those to function well uh, when you're, you're using them. And um, our uh, ancestors in the past certainly um, were savvy with their technology and, and uh, well equipped to, to do the kinds of things that they wanted to do with those. So um, they help us understand the kind of hunting and gathering life way that these uh, ancient hunters um, use. Archaeologists do investigate change. So the three thing, the third thing that we're interested in here is, is the investigation of change and, and sort of roughly thinking about the, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. We've got change through time and we're emphasizing the technological change, which is pretty easy for archeologists to record um, changes in how technology um, is made through time. Um, and uh, we certainly know about the rapidity of, uh, rapidness of technological change today so that um, a cell phone of the late 90s or early 2000s um, looks quite, um, quaint to us in 2020. So we, we, we can recognize an older variety of cell phone, even though it's only 20 years old. In the past, things changed a little bit slower than they do today, but we can still use the artifacts to tell us about um, change. But we're not only interested in technological change, we're interested in, in the people and how people's life ways changed. So we talked about that hunting and gathering life way of 9,000 years ago. And that went roughly um, unchanged in any major way until agriculture um, more along the lines of 4,000 to 5,000 years ago when 
really a horticulture began, and then a, a great full commitment to growing corn, beans, and squash in North America happened only about a thousand years ago. And um, that was a huge change for people's life ways. So we might think about for a long period of time, people living as hunters and gatherers. And up until 14,000 years ago, even to 10,000 years ago, all peoples on the planet lived by hunting and gathering. So lived in these small groups of people moving around their landscape, taking advantage of the resources as they became available. At, at, at some points in time, those hunter gatherers began to settle in one place, not necessarily because they wanted to, but in some cases because they had to because population was increasing. They didn't, they didn't have places to move anymore. So they began to be stuck in um, one place and had to make the environment more productive. So they turned to horticulture first, uh, sort of the management of plants, and then full-scale agriculture, as I mentioned about a thousand years ago. And that full-scale agriculture resulted in obvious changes in people's lives and in the archaeological record. Now we have many more houses. We have mounds being built, and some houses are on top of mounds. So some people are literally above other people. We built a wall around our houses, so we're protecting ourselves from others. And again, we 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 cultivated a large area, so we see fields of corn, beans, and squash around our, our village site here. When we look at the burials in the mounds, they differ from burials that aren't in mounds. So people in the mounds are buried with more items, and these items are often of exotic manufacture. They're not made from local materials. Their designs are often different than the local everyday designs. So people are not only figuratively um, living above and literally living above. Um, so, so people buried in the mounds have greater access to prestige items. And when we look at their skeleton, often th they have less signs of stress, uh, particularly any kinds of malnourishment or food stress. Um, we, we, we see more evidence of potential stress in skeletons that are outside the mounds. Um, so, so there's, some real differences in society here. Those hunter-gatherers that we talked about, everybody's buried pretty much the same, same level of health and nutrition. So with agriculture comes a change in the social political organization so that some people literally um, ha are treated in death differently and, and live a life that's somewhat different than their um, other people in the same village. So I promise to talk a little bit about the future. Um, so archaeologists are interested in the past to help us say something about the future. The idea being that if we can reconstruct culture change, um, not just the sequence of going from stone tools to bronze tools to iron tools, but why did things change, that that might give us a sense of where we're going in the future. So this is a picture from 1950 what an artist thought the year 2000 might look like. So my point being with this, we're not particularly good at predicting the future as, as people in general. So uh, it's maybe hard for you to see, but I'll, I'll explain what I can of this image. So there's a little yellow machine in the bottom right that is a cultivator. It's out on the ocean, so you have these um, uh, plots of soil floating on the ocean because we filled up all the land masses. There's no place for agriculture on land anymore. It's filled with people. So we're doing agriculture on top of the ocean. Um, and we have cities out on the ocean. You see it in the, in the uh, background there. So um, we have a future that um, had filled up the planet by the year 2000. So just looking 50 years into the future, mm, these folks didn't quite get it right. So I, I won't say that archaeologists are, are particularly great at looking to the future, uh, I, but one thing I can say, um, you know, we can't look at the future with, with a lot of detail, but when there are changes in population size and population density, we tend to see changes in culture. So that population increase was probably a push, a driver 
for the adoption of agriculture. Hunter-gatherers had some sense of planting seeds would, would make them grow and they'd been managing um, areas for um, plants and so forth to, to encourage their growth but full-time commitment to agriculture there's a lot of work involved in agriculture and hunter-gatherers um, even in marginal environments in the 1950s 1960s they were working 35 to 40 hours a week to feed everybody in their group um, 35 to 40 hours a week sounds pretty good in terms of working. Uh, probably many of you like me are working 50, 60 hours a week or more when you include all the chores we do at home and the, the work we do uh, outside of the home. So hunting and gathering was not a, a bad way to live. They're not always living on the edge of starvation uh, in particular. They didn't produce much surplus, so they were working relatively constantly um, you know, not they weren't taking two week vacations necessarily, but um, they did just fine. But when you get more mouths to feed, you have to make the environment more productive. So you're forced into agriculture. And then that has a whole host of other changes that come along with it. So one thing that archaeologists would point to for the future is that as our population goes up on the planet, and I think we're predicted to be somewhere between 10 to 12 million by 2050. So in roughly 30 years, we'll have not quite doubled our current population. We're about seven and a half billion. So getting to 10 to 12 billion doesn't double it, but that's gonna have um, some changes that go along with that to feed and house and shelter and meet the needs of 10 to 12 billion people on this planet, there's gonna be some cultural changes. So archeologists are, are full, uh, fully aware of, of that potential change. It may not mean gardens on the ocean or anything, but, but something's gonna change here. Um, archeologists can't say with any specificity where it will be some type of utopian future in the top left or a more dystopic future in the bottom right. Um, but we can say that there, there will be culture change as populations increase. Um, archaeologists aren't the only ones who've looked to the future. Um, Time Magazine, just a couple of covers to, to get you to think about the future, so to speak. Uh, can Google solve death? Um, so that would make for an interesting future if population is driving, uh, population increase is driving culture change. Um, that would certainly uh, have an impact on population and, and social change uh, if, if Google solves death. And another one, the class of 2025, how they'll learn and what they'll pay. And I don't know if those predictions will come true in either case, but it is something to think about. So archaeologists want to add their voice to our thinking about the future because we do think that it's beneficial for us to keep the future in mind um, because if we see a future that we don't like, maybe we can work now to change it. One archaeologist in particular, uh, Dr. Robert L. Kelly, has written a book um, published a few years ago called The Fifth Beginning, what six million years of human history can tell us about our future. And Kelly goes through um, in this book what archaeology is about, what we've learned about the past, and he suggests that we've gone through four beginnings. And for Kelly, a beginning is when um, our ancestors were trying to be the best at one thing, they hit a tipping point, and then something completely different comes afterward. Um, and so his beginnings are the beginning of technology with those stone tools about three million years ago, that that changed the trajectory of our ancestors. So that those ancestors who were able to make and use stone tools became something totally different than what they were prior to that. Then it's the origins of culture, particularly symbolic culture, that um, our ancestors adopted um, culture and, and by using and, and employing culture began to do things very different than ancestors prior to that. So um, language, art um, began to uh, have us interact in ways that other uh, creatures on the planet simply don't. 
and then the origins of agriculture is a, is a beginning, and then the origin of civilizations or state level societies. And Kelly talks about how the archaeological record demonstrates how each of these beginnings change in, in, in by way of the distribution of material culture and the kinds of material culture that archaeologists find. And he says since the year 1500 AD, we begin seeing that, that we're at a tipping point where the archaeological record has gone through a fundamental change. So he suggests that we're in a fifth beginning and we're going to have then a tipping point and a very different future in some unknown amount of time that it's, it's coming. Archaeologists, you know, we don't think in just tens of years uh, or even hundreds of years. We generally think in terms of thousands of years. But Kelly would argue that that sometime in the relatively near future, we're going to change the, our, our, our life way. And, and I don't want to give away all of his conclusions um, about what that future might look like. Uh, he actually has a very positive view of the future. Not everyone who looks to the future does, but, but Kelly has a positive view of the future in this book, and, and I recommend that you look at it, or we might talk about that in a future uh, Coffee with an Archaeologist. Maybe we can get Dr. Kelly to be part of that. So that's my quick look at archaeology. We went through three things archaeologists don't do. So you know that archaeologists don't dig for dinosaurs, we don't just work in Egypt, and we don't dig for treasure. You know that archaeology is the study of people in the past through artifacts. And you know that archaeologists are interested in dating those artifacts. Archaeologists want to learn about life ways from those artifacts. And archaeologists want to look at culture change. And it's that interest in culture change that I think gives value to archaeology. Because if we can understand how and why cultures change, that can give us some insight into the future and we're all interested in what the future might hold. So I hope you found this presentation informative, and if you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so we're going to uh, switch out of the slide share view and go to um, answering some questions. All right, so if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and submit them to our chat box and I will help check through here to see what we've got. How far, uh, how do you know how far you need to excavate? So how do you decide that? That is a great question. And, and sometimes we, we stop our excavations too soon. We haven't gone deep enough. Um, so it, it depends on where we're at um, to some degree. So you can certainly be working in a river valley and hit a clay soil that you think is what we would call subsoil, that there wouldn't be any occupation below it, and you push through that clay subsoil and it turns out that it was capping um, other archaeological deposits. So you, you need to know your environment, um, but if you're on a ridge top, sometimes we can hit a clay subsoil that's sterile, that has no, uh, that's older than, than the human occupation would be, in 10 or 15 centimeters below the surface, so very shallow because ridge tops are often eroding environments. But if you think about a river valley where you have soil building up through flooding and, and other deposits, you know, it can be quite deep. So it's working with uh, geologists, um, and there's a specialty called geoarchaeology where you sort of read through those soils. And I, I didn't really talk about radiometric dating, but we can do radiometric dating and, and get a sense of how old those soils are. But, um, you know, we, we don't want to put our preconceived notions, oh, well, this is too old for humans to have been here. If we don't dig deep enough, then maybe we're just uh, fulfilling our own biases. So that's a tricky question and one we have to apply on a site-by-site -site basis. Great, thanks. So Trinity, asks, where in the world have you traveled to excavate? Do you have a favorite place? Oh, that's a great question, Trinity. Um, I got to work one summer in St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, and we were actually working on a plantation site, and that was a pretty neat place to be excavating in the summer because at the end of the day, you got to walk down to the beach and cool off in the in the uh, water, so that was pretty cool. 
I did primitive tent camping in Nevada at that rock shelter I showed. And that was some of the coolest archaeology I've ever done because we actually found artifacts that were a thousand years old that, it, that, so we found a stone tool that was attached still to the shaft. Um, uh, and and, and it's, it's 800 years old. So we were finding um, basketry, bits of sandals, um, fletching for arrows and, and other things that were hundreds and thousands of years old because it was a dry rock shelter to preserve. So here in the southeastern United States, only very rarely do we find organic artifacts like that. So that rock shelter in Nevada was really, really cool. But I, I do enjoy archaeology here in the southeast. We've got a, a rich archaeological record, um, a very interesting past. So doing archaeology in Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi, uh, I think there's some of the, the coolest archaeology you can do. Um, the Poverty Point site in Louisiana, it's a state park. Um, it's not particularly appropriately named. Um, uh, Southern Planter in the 19th century owned the site and plowed it um, and lost all, plowed on top of a mound, actually, a, a bird-shaped mound. But this site is is 5,000 years old and was occupied by hunter-gatherers and has these huge mounds on it. So we're archaeologists are still interested in how the, this sort of small-scale society could put so much labor into building these mounds. Um, it's a state park. If you're ever in uh, sort of northeast Louisiana, it would certainly be worth going to to visit. They have a great little museum there. It's one of the coolest sites that I've, I've worked on. Um, so, I, you know, it's it's continental U.S. for me, where I've done archaeology, although I've, I've visited archaeological sites in Belize, and the Mayan sites there are incredible and certainly uh, worth visiting as, as, as tourists. So um, I've done archaeology in the West, here in the Southeast, a little bit in the, I don't think any further north than Ohio and Indiana. Um, so that's sort of been, been my spread. All right. We'll go, we have a couple more questions in the chat. So the next one is, whoops, no one, another one just came through here. <laughs> Once you find older objects, how do you demarcate areas for further excavation? That's a great question. So most archeologists are employed in an area called cultural resource management. And that sounds very technical and I suppose it is, but um, we very systematically, when we're conducting cultural resource management, look for archaeological sites on the landscape. So we'll space each other out 30 meters apart, and then every 30 meters we'll dig a shovel test. And a shovel test is not particularly uh, fancy. So it's a 30 centimeter round hole, and we dig it until we hit one of those clay subsoils, and we screen all the dirt, and we look for artifacts. I've probably dug 10,000 or more shovel tests that had nothing in them. So there's, you know, so when you find something in a shovel test, you give a woo-woo, got something. And then the crew comes over and you begin to excavate at 10 meter intervals to see what else you can find and get the distribution of artifacts on, on, the, on the site. So you can say, this is how large the site is based on the distribution of artifacts in our shovel test. Once we've done that and we say, well, we've identified the site, but is a site important? Can it answer one of our questions? Can it help us um, date uh, peoples in the past? Can it help tell us about life ways? Can it help us in, in investigate culture change? So we need to do square units for that, not just round shovel tests. So we set up a more formal grid on the site and we'll dig one meter by one meter units, um, keeping everything in very precise locations. Um, so to see if, if that site can answer questions on it. We, we call that archaeological site testing or phase two. And if it turns out that site's significant, we would recommend additional work, phase three archaeology, and we'll open up many of those one meter by one meter units in block areas to try to recover a really good sample of artifacts so we can get a sense of what life was like at that, at that site. Awesome, thanks. So the next question, um, do we have any projects uh, on the table for our area? So um, we were doing a lot of archaeology with the Mobile um, River Bridge, uh, the I-10 bridge, um, in preparation for that to be built. And as many of you probably know, that bridge was put on um, hold. So uh, 
we're you know maybe looking for that project in the future so we want to make sure that the construction of the bridge doesn't destroy any of the archaeological record around mobile uh, area um, so that project has been put on hold so we've switched gears a little bit um, we're uh, our, our current projects mainly involve doing archaeological survey that phase one work for the DeSoto National Forest in Mississippi and the Conecuh National Forest in, in Alabama, central Alabama. So we're out looking for archaeological sites before they cut any timber. We want to make sure those sites are protected. So those are the main projects we're doing right now. We like to try to have an active volunteer program, but with our pandemic, we've kind of put that on hold. And once we get a handle on that, we hope to begin to uh, start some local projects. Uh, Dr. Aaron Nelson, the other archaeologist here at the University of South Alabama, had planned a field school this past May, but because of the pandemic, we had to cancel that field school. So um, we're going to be looking for what sites we might be working on and hopefully could invite some of you uh, to help us with those in the future. Great, I think we're, we're pretty good on time here. So you, you game for a couple more questions? Sure. Okay, uh, apart from carbon dating, what other methods are used? That's a great question. Carbon dating is a wonderful technique um, and it's particularly good for items that aren't too old. Um, uh, so it, not wanna get into too much chemistry, but if too much of the radioactive carbon has turned to nitrogen, we can't measure it. So if, our, if, if, if um, samples are over 75,000 years old, we really can't use radiocarbon dating. And if they're too young, we can't use radiocarbon dating. So if we wanna date things like the first stone tool manufacturer three million years ago, we would use argon-argon dating, uh, or potassium argon dating, so other radiometric techniques of dating, and you can only apply those to volcanic rock or volcanic ash. Radiocarbon dating can only be applied with um, organic materials. Um, there's a host of other dating techniques, um, electron spin resonance, um, and, and of course, the more relative dating, like I mentioned, the law of superposition, but fluorine dating is another relative uh, dating technique. So we have a, a wide range of dating techniques, which is good because we need to apply more than one in any situation because we want to cross check because samples can be contaminated, there can be disturbances. So we really want to cross check our, our dating because that's our, the first thing we really want to do. How old are things? Does the scientific testing of artifacts ever destroy them? Yes, it can. So uh, doing radiocarbon dating and other types of chemical analyses, you don't get the sample back. Um, so we have to be very cognizant of that. Um, so, you know, make the decision, is it worth uh, going ahead and processing this or should we save this for a fu the future when maybe a technique, a scientific technique is improved or something along those lines. So we only do destructive analyses in very uh, special situations when it, when it can really um, answer some of the questions that, that we have. But we sometimes do have to destroy some of the things that we have um, in order to get the information. And remember, you only excavate an archeological site once. Once you dig a one meter by one meter unit, nobody can come behind you and dig it again. So we take those notes um, and we excavate very carefully because the science of archaeology demands that we make these observations so someone can come behind us and evaluate our work to see if our conclusions are valid based on the, 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 the careful work that, that we do. So not only do we sometimes destroy artifacts, we actually destroy an archaeological site when we excavate it. But because we're doing that to answer questions and recover the information, it's worthwhile. All right, thank you. Lots of great questions this morning. Um, got one more in the chat box here. Would you say new civilizations have been built over older ones, given that artifacts have been found on excavating? A few years back, the remains of an English king were found in a present day parking lot. <laughs> That's a great observation. And indeed, uh, people, uh, when they find a good place to live, they tend to reoccupy that place. Um, so we do find that um, older remains are often covered up by more recent ones. Um, 
sometimes almost purposefully um, that uh, in a situation like Mobile where um, the riverfront is quite low, um, knocking down older buildings and building on top actually then provides a, a foundation and gets you out of potentially rising waters and so forth. Um, so we see that in many uh, places where there are older artifacts deeper down that we excavate in locations because you know, people like to have uh, proximity to water, right? Don't want to have to go too far for clean water. So be near a, a river or stream or um, something like Mobile Bay is, is a good place to live. And you often don't want to live in a swamp for the obvious reasons of flooding and so forth. So finding a, a well-drained ridge um, and with good access to water and other resources, that's the kind of places people live and they tend to occupy those uh, again and again through time. Great, thanks. Does anyone have any uh, more questions? We have a few more minutes if you want to submit a, a last question or two before we wrap up. I'll give you a few seconds if anyone's got any questions. I'll go ahead and announce our next session um, in our series will be October 14th at 10 a.m. We're going to have a session um, on mortuary archaeology, which might be fitting for the month of October. Um, Dr. Matt Maternes with New South Associates is going to give a presentation for us. So mark your calendars for that. Um, and I will be posting information on that uh, pretty quickly here. And I'll open the registration about two weeks before. So um, great, Trinity. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Um, we got one more question from Carmen. How do you feel about shows like Oak Island? I'm not real familiar with Oak Island, but I can kind of guess maybe that it's one of these shows that um, tends to be on the fringe or the fantastic side of archaeology where they're trying to um, add a lot of drama to archaeology and, and um, our, most of the time archaeology is not particularly dramatic. Uh, sometimes when we're doing cultural resource management we do have deadlines and schedules we have to meet so there's often the stress or pressure of, of meeting deadlines um, but um, our archaeology is more painstaking and meticulous and kind of making sure you're following the right methods and doing what you do. Um, archaeology can be quite exciting. It is really neat to be the first person to touch an artifact that has lain in the earth for 5,000, 10,000 years. Um, so I, I don't want to downplay archaeology too much. But uh, on the other hand, some of these shows um, tend to focus on the fantastic and the outlandish um, and sort of push, I don't know, ancient aliens and things of that nature. And that, that kind of bothers me to some degree because often we're denigrating the people who actually accomplished these things in the past. Uh, we don't have to imagine aliens building the pyramids. It was uh, the ingenuity and sweat and blood and tears of uh, Egyptian peoples who built the pyramids. Um, and we certainly shouldn't take that away from them uh, by postulating that it could only have been aliens that, that did something or something along those lines. So. Again, I'm sorry I don't know too much about Oak Oak Island, but sometimes these these shows that are that get out there um, make archaeologists cringe a little bit. Yeah, I'm gonna have to um, I'm gonna have to look that one up. I'm gonna have to do some googling when we finish here. <laughs> All right. Well, um, looks like we're about wrapped up here. If anyone's got any last minute quick questions, um, we're going to go ahead and thank you all so much for joining. If you've got a skedaddle, um, go ahead. And uh, great thing about our, our Zoom meetings is everyone can kind of quietly leave when they need to. So I um, want well, thank you guys so much again. Thank you, Dr. Carr. This was great. And hopefully we will see you all next month. All right. Thank you, Candace. Thank you, everyone, for, for showing up today in our virtual Zoom room. And um, uh, we, we look forward to you visiting the Archaeology Museum when we can open again. Um, and, and we really want, uh, hopefully, we can see you all there. Bye, everyone. Bye.